Did you have trouble crossing under this bridge in chapter two? Well, here's a trick that allows any build to get across. Kick spamming. This technique is useful in so many situations. I think this is by far the most energy efficient way to cover distance in Armored Core 6. It can save you if you're about to fall off a stage. It can get you across vast distances. It can get you higher than you'd otherwise be able to go. So definitely consider this, especially if you're equipped with tank treads. I think their kick gets you the furthest. Speaking of kicks, you might have noticed that kicks don't just do impact damage, they deal direct damage as well. And while you might think that leg type would play a part in direct damage or impact dealt, it doesn't. However, the direct damage of your kick is affected by something. It's affected by the weight of your AC. For example, this is a kick with a lightweight AC, and here's a kick with the heaviest tank I could make. What's also interesting is that kicks do roughly three times as much damage to enemies when they're staggered, which is a much bigger multiplier than most other weapons have. Combine this with the fact that you can spam kicks pretty fast, this can be a really lethal tool, especially if you have nothing else to do while reloading. And on some enemies, like tetrapod MTs, you can extend the duration of their stagger if you kick them during this state. So if you haven't worked kicks into your playstyle yet, absolutely do that. But let's be honest, more important than anything else in this video is your fashion. Your armor decor, so to speak. And one key part of your fashion is your booster color. Because did you notice that booster color isn't determined by the booster part? Instead, it's actually determined by your generator. For example, this generator gives me a blue booster, which actually turns my gold AC like an ugly green. This one gives a nice default orange, which is better. But this coral generator gives me this awesome red color. And even though it has a recharge delay of like five seconds, you know I'm still gonna use it. Speaking of fashion though, this is my LG Corporation AC. And I made this because LG are actually our corporate sponsor for this video. So I wanted to do a video with LG because uniquely among From Software games, Armored Core 6 actually has amazing widescreen support. So LG sent over one of their ultra wides for me to show you guys, and I was absolutely blown away. This, I think, is unironically the best way to play Armored Core, in my opinion. The curved screen just makes this game so immersive, and having a wide field of view is legitimately incredible for your situational awareness, because you can see all of the enemies around you while you're fighting. So this is the LG Ultra Gear OLED 45GR95QE. Sounds like it could be a part in game. It's a 45 inch 21 by nine display with a clean, really borderless design and also a crazy fast 0.03 millisecond response time, which makes it perfect for gaming. They're also touting this as the world's first 240 Hertz OLED gaming monitor. If you're interested in investing in one for yourself, check out the link in the description. And thank you to LG for sponsoring this video. Number five, if you ever run out of energy in the air, you are extremely vulnerable. You can't dodge or fly. All you can do is fall. But did you know that falling directly down is actually the best thing you can do in this situation a lot of the time? When you push forward on the left analog stick, as long as your boosters are toggled on, you'll still float somewhat horizontally, even when you're completely out of energy. Note our speed while we're doing this. However, if you let go of the left stick completely, your boosters will deactivate and you'll enter free fall mode. In this state, you'll fall a lot faster, even though it says your boosters are still on. Just look at the speed difference. Therefore, free falling straight down can actually make you way more avoidant of projectiles coming your way, especially if you're falling perpendicular to the shot that's coming your way. So consider doing this as a last resort next time you run out of energy in the air. Number six. So target assist can be great. It gives you unparalleled focus on single enemies and it makes it way easier for you to focus on dodging and flying, but it's actually not the optimal way to play. That's because when you toggle on target assist, your tracking strength is actually compromised and less of your shots will find their mark as a result. This is absolutely something you can feel in the gameplay. 
And you might have even noticed how much more your reticle lags behind when you're locked on in this way. But the question is, how bad is this effect? How much is your tracking strength compromised when using target assist? Let's try to figure it out. So there are a lot of variables that make this really hard to test in a vacuum. We have to ensure that our enemy is moving in pretty much the exact same way, at the exact same speed, at the exact same distance, with target assist toggled on and then off. So I came up with this, the jump test. With this, distance and movement become controlled variables, and we can really try to narrow down the difference in accuracy with target assist toggled on and off. Here's what I found. So at 50 meters, with target assist off, 0.018% of my shots missed, compared to 12% of my shots missing with target assist. At 100 meters, with target assist off, 27% of my shots missed, compared to 47% with target assist. And at 150 meters with target assist off, it was 44%, compared to 61% with target assist. And then at 200 meters, 55% of my shots missed without it, and 74% missed with target assist. So just at a glance from that data, target assist is clearly having a big impact here. In many cases, almost twice as many of my shots missed while using target assist. Now, admittedly, I didn't get like a huge sample size here, and I only tested this with one weapon, so I'd really like to invite someone better than me to perform the jump test more thoroughly. If I find someone who does a really good experiment online, I'll pin their results in the comments section below. But for now, I think it's safe to say that you really should be trying to learn to play without target assist if you can, especially if your enemy is small and agile. For number seven, let's talk about these gaps. So often, advice I give when building an AC is to try and stay as close to your maximum loads as possible. This will ensure that you're packing on the most value that your legs and generator can support. That said, there are benefits to leaving gaps here that you might not know about. In regards to your maximum load, a larger gap will contribute towards your boost speed. So notice how my boost speed becomes faster when I just unequip my weapons. That's because leftover load contributes to your speed. You can even achieve this boost to your speed by purging weapons during a mission. What's interesting is that a similar logic applies to your EN load as well. The larger the gap, the faster your energy bar will recharge. That's because leftover EN output contributes towards your supply efficiency stat. The higher this value, the faster your energy bar will move after the recharge delay. Just look at this difference. Now, it's really cool that the game rewards your excess like this, but I will say in my experience the benefits of having a large gap still don't really outweigh the benefits of just stacking on better parts instead. For example, like your energy is coming back fast either way, you know, but it's a nice thing to have for sure. Another thing that's really nice to have is the hangar bay upgrade in your OS tuning screen. This allows you to store two more arm parts on your back. Note, however, that you can't fire these weapons when they're stored in the hangar. Instead, L1 and R1 will just switch to these weapons for your arms instead. And when you first think about it, that seems kind of bad, right? After all, wouldn't you just want to fire four weapons at once? Isn't that more DPS than just two? However, consider this. Weapons that overheat can cool down in the hangar. Weapons can even reload while they're in the hangar. So just think about how good that is. With this technique, you can offset the downside of some of the strongest weapons in the game. Fire your chain guns to overheat and then switch to shotguns while they cool down in the hangar. Break guards with the Pal Bunker melee weapon, then pull out a sword to capitalize on that while it cools down or just equip four machine guns and switch them out whenever you need to reload. This way, your DPS is absolutely unrelenting, and I unironically think, after testing a lot of this stuff, that hangar builds will end up being some of the strongest builds in the game. Anyway, speaking of OS upgrades, do you regret any of the OS upgrades you've invested in? Well, don't worry, because by pressing triangle or Y in this menu, you can undo each upgrade you've purchased for 4,000 credits. 
One reason I redid my points is because I realized that the most efficient way to invest your points is actually to invest in the lowest tier of many upgrades rather than going deep into just one. That's because the lowest tiers are the cheapest, so it's kind of best to buy all the low tiers first. Number 10. This next trick is particularly good when you're fighting an enemy AC, though I'll admit it's a pretty high skill cap thing to do, and that's melee cancelling. So by tapping quick boost right at the end of your melee boost, you're able to cancel your melee boost and immediately initiate it again creating a loop where you're constantly moving, closing in on, and threatening the enemy AC without even overheating your weapon. This is particularly good if you've chosen a booster that has a really good melee attack thrust and a melee attack EN consumption spec, as these can enable you to close the gap between enemies more effectively than even an assault boost could. It also looks cool as hell. That's kind of the main reason to do this, honestly. But the coolest thing you can do in Armored Core is S-ranking missions. According to the game, to achieve an S-rank rating, you must complete the mission without retrying from a checkpoint, while also minimizing incoming damage, time taken, and ammunition consumed. In practice, though, it's actually not that simple. For example, in the mission Destroy the Transport Helicopters, I finished the objectives extremely fast without taking a point of damage and only got an A-rank. To achieve an S rank, I realized it helped a lot to actually kill some enemies as well. The game doesn't tell you that you need to kill enemies, but that is important, apparently. And then for certain missions, it seems like the S rank criteria are weighted differently. For example, in a Chapter 2 mission, I destroyed the Smart Cleaner very quickly, but I used dual Gatling guns to do it. And even though I didn't die, I achieved a really low rank for some reason. For this mission, it seems ammunition cost counted against me greatly. And then there was this mission, where I took a ton of damage and I was sure that I did terribly, and then I got an S rank. Turns out this mission has an extremely high tolerance for the damage you take. So my takeaway from all of this is that while it's certainly possible to S rank by focusing on just doing one thing well, there are missions where it feels like some things matter more than most. So definitely try and switch up your build and strategy if you're not having much success. Build for speed or kills or low ammunition cost or low damage taken and see how you go prioritizing different things. But what's the reward for S ranking every mission in the game, you ask? Well, it makes you feel good. According to my reviewer guide, you get a trophy and an achievement and that's it, which I'll admit is a little bit disappointing. I wish there was some incentive but I guess it's more about the journey in the end. One of the metrics for S-ranking missions is, again, not being wasteful with your ammunition. So you might think that reloading manually and just throwing away the entire rest of the magazine would be wasteful, right? Wrong, because video game laws are in effect here, and when you reload in Armored Core 6, your magazine will magically fill with the exact amount of ammunition you need despite that kind of being physically impossible. That means that you only really need to worry about the ammunition that you fire in a mission, and nothing more. Being wasteful is a pretty fast way to rack up some debt in Armored Core 6, though admittedly incurring debt is quite rare. Even if you're firing the most expensive weaponry, this is the most debt I could get when I tried, for example. I just quickly wanted to confirm that yeah, it is possible to go negative in a mission and lose money, Though, no matter how much you waste or lose, it's impossible to actually go negative in terms of your total funds in the garage. Speaking of firing ammunition, there are many situations where you might want to consider staggering your fire rather than unloading all at once. For example, when fighting a fast opponent like an enemy AC, it's very likely that they'll dodge your attacks, especially your missiles. So, for example, if you unload two sets of missiles at them at once, they can just easily negate both of those salvos with one dodge. Instead, what you should do is fire one after the other with a short delay. This way, you're far more likely to catch them during or after a dodge with at least one set of missiles. The same applies to weapons with a slow firing rate. Take dual shotguns, for example. If I fire both at once, they're both liable to miss. But if I fire one after the other, even if I miss one, the second is far more likely to connect. 
spacing out your shots also makes it less likely that enemies will get a chance to recover their ACS buildup, which is what can happen if they go too long without taking damage. Next, I believe that there are just two status effects in Armored Core 6, ACS Anomaly and Electrical Discharge. However, the game doesn't really explain what these are, so I'll try. ACS Anomaly is built up over time with fire-based attacks. When the bar fills completely, you'll receive this warning, which lasts for about 10 seconds. During this time, the impact damage you receive is significantly increased. Compare this, for example, to this. And while we're looking at this stagger gauge, it's important to note that the middle bar is easier to fill up than the outer bars. Essentially, it seems like this middle section counts as one bar, and filling the outer two bars takes twice as long. There are two bars on the outside, after all. So effectively, it seems like ACS Anomaly increases the impact damage you take by about 50% for 10 seconds, which makes it really quite an impactful status effect. The other status effect in AC6 is the shock status effect, which I figured out is essentially bleed from other FromSoft games. Basically what happens is when you take electrical damage, your elec discharge bar will fill, doing a burst of damage once at the end when the bar is completely filled. What's interesting about this shock effect in this game though is that it's actually not percentage-based damage, unlike Bleed from previous games. Regardless of your AP, this effect seems to do a flat 1600 damage, meaning shock will kind of naturally be better against lightweight ACs rather than heavy ones. Of course, you can build up status effects on other enemies as well, even non-AC enemies like MTs, though it's worth noting that clearly some enemies have more resistance than others, and some bosses effectively seem immune to status effects entirely. Now, there kind of is a third status effect, although it's strictly not one as well. It's the smoke bomb, which has an effect that creates a little bubble, a little zone, and while you're inside this zone, you can't lock on to enemies outside it, and they can't lock on to you if you're inside it either. However, if you're both inside the zone, then you can lock on to each other. And if this smoke is in between both of you, it actually acts like a piece of terrain wood. It blocks you from locking onto the enemy at a distance as well, essentially. This is really cool, but as its description states, it's going to take a lot of finesse to effectively use this in combat. If there are more status effects in the game I haven't listed, I apologize. I'm playing through the game really thoroughly, but I'm playing through really slowly as well. I've only just finished chapter 3, so it's possible that there's more that I'm missing. Number 16. Cancelling. This is only mentioned very briefly in training, so remember, pressing triangle or Y will allow you to cancel certain actions. For example, if you're charging a weapon and no longer want to charge it, just press triangle or Y. And if you've started a multi-lock that you regret, you can also press triangle or Y to revert to a single lock. Now, I'm kind of shocked that this next tip isn't in the official tutorial, and that's that in most situations, it's not optimal to cancel your assault boost by pulling back on the left stick like the tutorial tells you to do. Doing this actually brings you to an abrupt halt which can easily get you killed. Instead, by pushing forward on the left stick and just tapping the ascend button, you're able to cancel your assault boost and maintain your forward momentum, which is just objectively better. Number 18. So unlike in other FromSoft games, you can't actually load multiple saves in the main menu. You can only have one playthrough active at any time. So be careful of that new game button this time around, since it will overwrite your current save. I can kind of see why they made it this way. The game is designed around replaying missions and going into New Game Plus, after all. One thing that oddly does seem to persist if you start a new game is your AC data from your previous save. If you didn't know, in this menu, you can quickly build your old saved AC designs, though of course you still need their parts. Um, I'd also quickly like to mention that you can upload your AC designs in this menu as well. This will give you a code to share with others who might want to create your AC. Here's the code for my LG AC, though 
This doesn't seem to work cross-platform. The same goes for emblem designs. While you're in the garage, one thing not many people realize you can do is enter photo mode while you're here. Here, you can fly your camera around quite far and explore the little container that you're a stowaway within. And of course, the same photo mode can be activated while you're out on a mission during the pause menu. Another small thing, but there are situations where you really should use the compass and the radar that's built into it. In this mission, for example, it's important for me to head towards enemies as soon as they appear, and my radar is the best way of doing that. What's more, lots of information shows up down here, like target objectives and more. These little arrows, for example, also indicate if an enemy is above or below you in that direction. If you're on your first attempt, or don't care at all about S-ranking a mission, consider simply restarting from checkpoints as soon as you notice that you've reached one. For example, here I've taken so much damage that there's just no way I'm going to beat Sula in this upcoming fight. It would be a waste of my time. Instead, as soon as I notice this indicator in the bottom right, I can just manually start from the checkpoint and fully restore my AP and my repair kits. For number 22, remember that your standard repair kit heals a flat 4,000 AP. So when healing, try to make sure that you've taken 4,000 damage before healing it. And when building an AC, consider that you functionally have 12,000 more AP than what it's showing you on screen. So when you think about your functional AP and keep healing in mind, the difference between a heavyweight AC with a lot of AP and a lightweight AC with not much AP, the difference between them gets smaller when you take into account that both builds have 12,000 AP on top of what they already have. That said, repair kits aren't a thing in the arena, so I think that heavy ACs really will benefit from their raw AP and defensive stats a lot more there. And just one extra thing. When you fall off the map in Armored Core 6, you don't take a flat AP punishment. Instead, falling off the map will take 35% of your total AP. Let's talk about some of the lesser used OS tuning upgrades. One of the worst kind of has to be access speed optimization, which increases your interaction speed by 50% and then 100%. This can be useful, but it's extremely situational. For example, some missions might have you hack something while you're in firing range, it's pretty good then. So I definitely consider this upgrade to be great for S ranking certain missions, but other than that, I'd rank it as a pretty low priority. One little secret you might have missed with this though is that objects have different scan levels associated with them. I've found three scan levels so far, and the higher that their S.LV is, the longer they will take to access. Another arguably less important OS tuning upgrade is the quick turn, which when unlocked allows you to do a 90 degree or a 180 degree turn of your mech and the camera by holding circle or B and turning your left stick in the desired direction. In any other Armored Core game, this would be incredible, but in Armored Core 6, it's kind of just all right. The best thing about it is that it moves your camera faster than you can, even with camera speed set to 10 though those playing with mouse and keyboard actually won't have this problem at all. It's worth unlocking this if you play with a controller and if you play without target assist, but I feel like most players can confidently give this one a miss. Another very niche OS upgrade is weight control, which lets you enter missions overweight and manually purge your weapons. Being over your weight limit seems to penalize your speed in a similar way to how being under your weight limit rewards your speed. So going into a mission overweight really isn't the worst thing in the world. The best use case I could think of for this would be when you use it in tandem with its manual purge function. This way you could enter a mission with heavy weaponry, you could use up those weapons, and then you could purge them if you no longer have a use for them. So. The best use case I could think of for that was to bring in heavy snipers, use them at a safe range where your lack of speed doesn't really matter, then purge them and get in close with your faster AC. What's also cool is that you'll get these weapons back after you've purged them at a resupply station, so you will be able to have them back for difficult boss encounters at the end of the mission. And if you do go with this purging strategy, consider choosing an arm part with a high melee specialization stat. 
This will increase the damage of your punches. But so far for me, I haven't really been able to build around weight control in a meaningful way. Maybe later in the game, I'll unlock some parts that make that viable. So I'm curious if you guys have any ideas for that. But that's it. Before I go, again, think about investing in an ultra wide monitor for your setup. It's so good. Links in the description. Thanks again to LG for sponsoring this video. Forget Balaam, forget Archibus. Thank you, LG. And I'll see you all next time.